Part two of this special lecture presentation on the core competency assessments is intended to introduce you to a few concepts and ideas that are directly related to the first core competency that will be assessed in this course, social responsibility. It will also provide you with some guidance about how to prepare to write your essay on social responsibility on Unit Exam 1. For our purposes, social responsibility is the extent to which an individual recognizes and acknowledges the fact that the decisions he or she makes, or the decisions that he or she does not make, may lead to specific outcomes for the lives of other people, or may have effects on the community generally. Similarly, it means that the actions or behaviors he or she undertakes, or those that he or she does not undertake, may lead to specific outcomes for the lives of other people, or may have effects on the community generally. Additionally, social responsibility may mean not only reducing or even ceasing behaviors that are poten potentially harmful to others, but also engaging in or undertaking actions that promote positive outcomes for others or for the community, even if failing to undertake the actions would not directly result in negative effects. Accepting social responsibility means that an individual is willing to take appropriate action to eliminate, or at a minimum, mitigate the negative effects on others of his or her actions. Accepting social responsibility may also include an obligation to undertake actions that will promote positive social outcomes for others and for the community. We see that a desire to promote greater social responsibility is a significant motivation for many specific public policies that are implemented at all levels of government in the United States. Let's consider a few examples. A state law that requires owners of motor vehicles to have their vehicles inspected annually for compliance with operational safety standards by a licensed inspection professional. Inspection for tire tread wear, proper steering, proper braking, etc. The law empowers police officers to cite motorists driving vehicles that do not have documentation indicating that the vehicle has passed a safety inspection. A state law that holds bartenders or anyone serving alcohol in a bar or restaurant legally liable for a customer's injuries or injuries or property damages to third parties as a result of a motor vehicle crash involving a DWI or DUI by the person the bartender or waiter served, if it can be established that the server knowingly served the customer causing the crash too much alcohol. Childhood immunization requirements, a state law that requires parents or legal guardians to have their children immunized according to established medical practices unless the parent or guardian can claim a religious exemption. A local city ordinance that sets stricter criminal penalties for motor vehicle operators who use a cell phone for text messaging or to conduct telephone conversations while driving. Hands-free devices and using a cell phone for navigation or music purposes accepted. A federal law that places an excise tax, a special sales tax that is, on non-essential high sugar content food items in effort to curb the obesity epidemic, particularly among children. A local city ordinance that prohibits smoking or vaping in all indoor businesses or government buildings that are open to the public. The law provides for financial penalties to be imposed on violators, including penalties on business owners who do not enforce the ban. A state law that requires any individual having knowledge of or suspecting physical, sexual, or verbal abuse of a child to report the information to law enforcement and imposes penalties for failing to report such abuse. What is the motivation of the political agendas of those who advocate for public policies intended to promote greater social responsibility? Let's briefly examine that question with respect to three of the examples provided. What might cause a state legislature to pass a law requiring vehicle safety inspections? Imagine a situation in which no such requirement currently exists. 
Do you think it is possible that a significant number of motorists might fail to properly maintain their motor vehicles? If the answer to that question is yes, can you imagine that at least some of those poorly maintained vehicles might pose some threat to the safety and well-being of other individuals in their property who might have a chance encounter with the operator of the poorly maintained vehicle? Let's assume that as a result of improper maintenance, the brakes of vehicle A fail at an intersection in which the operator of vehicle B has a green light. Vehicle A fails to stop and broadsides vehicle B as it lawfully proceeds through the intersection. The actions are more accurately the inactions of the operator of vehicle A, that is, failing to properly maintain his vehicle, has now had an impact on someone else. The impact may be either physical injury or property damage in this case, or perhaps both. In the absence of a state law requiring regular safety inspections, the operator of vehicle A had no real incentive to take into account the possible negative impacts his actions or inactions might potentially have on the operator of vehicle B. He has no incentive to behave in a socially responsible manner. Is it possible that alternatives to the required vehicle inspections may exist? That is, are there, is there more than one way in this example to promote behavior that is more socially responsible? Can you think of any reasonable alternatives? Before the mid-1990s, if you boarded an airplane or walked into a restaurant or a bar, or many other businesses that were open to the public, you probably would not have been surprised to see people smoking cigarettes. I can remember going to baseball games in the Astrodome in the 1970s and seeing a cloud of smoke hovering several dozen feet above the surface of the AstroTurf. When I was in graduate school in the 1980s, I had a professor who would chain smoke during our seminars, blowing smoke directly into the faces of graduate students his contributions to the seminar he disapproved of. In those days, people knew about the health effects of smoking, including secondhand smoke. But in the absence of a ban on smoking in public places, smokers had no real incentive to take into account the impact of their behavior on other people. However, after, after bans began to be enacted and penalties began to be imposed for violations in the 1990s, smokers amazingly had an incentive to change their behavior. As with the previous example, there may be any number of ways to reduce or eliminate smoking in public places. Give us some thought and see what you can come up with. Recall that I said that the concept of social responsibility is not only about stopping or minimizing behaviors that have harmful impacts on other people, but also includes the notion of promoting behaviors that have beneficial impacts. Consider the example of the state law that requires individuals to report suspected child abuse. The threat of penalties for not reporting suspected child abuse is intended to induce those who might otherwise tend to, quote, mind their own business, unquote, to take action in the interest of benefiting children who may be subject to abuse. Again, there are undoubtedly alternative ways of dealing with the problem of people being reluctant to report abuse. Try to think of some of those ways. In preparation for writing your essay on Unit Exam 1, you should think about each of the seven policy examples suggested earlier in this way. What is the behavior that government is attempting to eliminate or promote? What are the harmful or beneficial impacts of the behavior on other people? Are there alternatives to the suggested policy that might achieve the same outcomes? Now let's take a moment to briefly examine these matters from a bit more of an academic angle by briefly discussing a commonly occurring type of problem that economists call an externality. One flaw that many people believe can readily be observed in a capitalist economy is that while competitive markets may result in what economists refer to as an efficient level of output of a good, they do not necessarily produce the socially optimal level of output. 
government policy making, that is, intervention in said markets, they contend, may be warranted to produce the socially optimal level of output. It is best to think of this type of policy making as a response to what economists call the problem of externalities. Generally speaking, an externality is a spillover effect on a third party. There are two basic types of externalities that may exist in competitive markets, positive externalities and negative externalities. A positive externality means that a spillover benefit to society in general results from the production and consumption of a good. A negative externality means that the production and consumption of a given good results in spillover costs to society. Let's examine each in a tad more detail. In the study of competitive markets, economists say that a positive externality exists when all of the social benefits associated with the production and consumption of a good or service are not captured by the private market. When a positive externality exists, the market produces a less than socially optimal level of output. There is too little production and consumption. More generally, in other areas we might consider as well as in markets, there is too little of a desired behavior. Competitive markets produce the efficient level of output where the quantity of a good demanded in a market meets the quantity supplied to market, indicated here as Q subscript E. However, from society's perspective, a higher level of output, indicated here as Q superscript star, is preferable. Graphically, how can we achieve the optimal level of output Q superscript star? By increasing demand in this fashion, we can achieve the higher level of output. Alternatively, the optimal level of output can be achieved by increasing supply, as shown here. Moving a demand curve or a supply curve on a graph is easy to do, but how can government increase demand or supply in real-world markets? Governments usually attempt to increase the level of output by 1. subsidizing the production of the good or the service, or by 2. supplying the good or service itself. An example of a good or service that has positive externalities associated with its production and consumption is childhood immunizations. How has government attempted to increase the spillover health benefits to the public of childhood immunizations? We could leave the allocation of childhood immunizations to the private medical marketplace, where individual parents pay out of pocket for the cost of immunizing their children. However, if we did, most people would conclude that the result would be a less than socially optimal level of immunization. For most people, the belief is that the more children that are immunized, the better. Government can increase the output of childhood immunizations, that is, the number of children who are immunized, by subsidizing either the demand side or the supply side of the market. In other words, Government can give a voucher to parents who can then use it to have their children vaccinated for no cost. Or government can subsidize the pharmaceutical companies who produce the vaccines, who can then offer them to health care providers at dra dramatically reduced costs. Health care providers would then presumably pass the cost savings on to parents, incentivizing them to get the ch their children vaccinated. Alternatively, Government can increase the supply of vaccinations by setting up a health clinic and allowing parents to get their children vaccinated free of charge, or perhaps paying a de minimis fee of, say, $1 or $5. There are many other markets that have positive externalities associated with them. Can you think of some? A negative externality, on the other hand, exists when all of the social costs associated with the production and consumption of a good or service are not captured by the private market. When a negative externality exists, the private market produces a more than socially optimal level of output. There is too much production and consumption of the good produced by the market. 
Again, graphically, we can see that competitive markets produce the efficient level of output where quantity demanded meets quantity supplied, here at point Q subscript E. However, from society's perspective, a lower level of output, indicated here as Q superscript star, is preferable. Graphically, how can we achieve the optimal level of output Q superscript star? By decreasing demand, we can achieve the lower level of output. Alternatively, the, opt the optimal level of output can also be achieved by decreasing supply, as shown here. Again, moving the demand curve or a supply curve on a graph is relatively easy to do. But how can government decrease demand or supply in real-world markets? Government has four policy options for decreasing the level of output of a good. Number one, by placing regulations on either the production or consumption of the good. Number two, by taxing the good. This is called a Pigouvian tax. Number three, by prohibiting the market for the good if the negative effects of the market are considered to be so invidious as to warrant or uh, to make the elimination of the market entirely desirable, as in the markets for heroin, cocaine, and other illicit drugs. And four, through litigation or lawsuits that allow individuals to recover costs as a result of damages that the production and consumption of some goods may cause. The main reasons that government make policies to counter negative externalities is that, in the absence of such policies, no participant in the private market, either the buyer or the seller, has any rational reason to take into account the social costs resulting from the production and consumption of the good. A conspic conspicuous example of a market that creates negative externalities is the market for automobiles social costs are said to be external to the market. Actually, we can observe multiple negative externalities associated with the automobile market, but the emissions that result from burning fossil fuels as a result of uh, their source of propulsion is the most obvious. Neither the supply side of the market, that is manufacturers and automobile dealers, nor the demand side of the market, consumers, has any inducement to consider the full social costs, the full cost to society, from automobile emissions. Automobile makers have no reason to take the social cost of pollution into account when producing and selling their cars. Automobile owners and operators have no reason to do so when buying and operating their cars. That is to say, neither have any reason to internalize these otherwise external social costs. As I indicated, one way that governments attempt to force buyers and sellers in the automobile market to internalize these otherwise external social costs is by imposing regulations on either the production or the operation of vehicles. When governments regulate the production of automobiles by requiring manufacturers to equip their models with pollution control devices, they force the manufacturer to internalize the social costs of pollution from their automobiles. Developing and implementing new pollution control technologies increases production costs. These increased costs result in lower profits for manuf manufacturers, all other things being the same. Increased production costs will also likely result in higher prices for automobiles in the retail market. Consumers, following the law of demand, will buy fewer automobiles when they are faced with higher prices. Fewer automobiles on the roads means less pollution. So in theory, government regulations lead to a reduction in pollution from automobiles in two ways. First, there is a decrease in emissions resulting from the development of pollution control technologies. The automobiles that are on the roads pollute less than they would without the pollution control devices installed. Second, we also see, in theory, a reduction in pollution resulting from a lower level of output in the automobile market because higher retail prices means 
fewer cars on the road emitting pollutants into the air. Alternatively, or perhaps additionally, governments may impose regulations on the owners and operators of automobiles by requiring regular emissions inspections and owners to maintain their vehicles so that they comply with the standards. These requirements increase the cost of owning and operating automobiles. They force the owners and operators of cars to internalize the social cost from their vehicles. Owners may have to make costly repairs to keep their vehicles compliant with regulatory standards. Additionally, higher operation costs may result in reduced operation of automobiles, which results in yet greater reductions in emissions. As I said previously, there are other policy remedies for the problem of negative externalities. Paguvian taxes, for example, are sometimes imposed on either the supply side or the demand side of a market as a way of forcing market participants to internalize the otherwise external social costs. Large damage awards and civil lawsuits can also have the effect of forcing market participants to internalize social costs. And again, if the negative externalities associated with a market are perceived as being invidious enough, governments may resort to an extreme form of regulation, making the market illegal or prohibition of the market. For example, federal law makes it illegal to remove a catalytic converter from a motor vehicle. Removing a catalytic converter results in increased horsepower to the engine, but also increases toxic emissions from the vehicle. In other words, government has prohibited the market for the mechanical service, removal of the catalytic converter, because the toxic emissions that result impose costs on society. Let's circle back now to the concept of social responsibility. We might say that what governments are doing in their efforts to counter negative externalities is that they are essentially attempting to force people to take responsibility for the social cost of their action. So let's remind ourselves about what we mean by the concept of social responsibility. We have established that social responsibility refers to the extent to which an individual recognizes and acknowledges the fact that the decisions he or she makes, or those that he or she does not make, may lead to specific outcomes for the lives of other people, or may have effects on the community generally. Similarly, it means that the actions or behaviors he or she undertakes, or again, those he or she does not undertake, may lead to specific outcomes for the lives of other people, or may have effects on the community in general. Additionally, social responsibility may mean not only reducing or even ceasing behaviors that are potentially harmful to others, but also engaging in or undertaking actions that promote positive outcomes for others or for the community, even if failing to undertake the actions would not directly result in negative effects. Accepting social responsibility means that an individual is willing to take appropriate actions to eliminate or at a minimum mitigate the negative effects on others of his or her actions. Accepting social responsibility may also include an obligation to undertake actions that will promote positive social outcomes for other individuals and for the community. But we have learned that individuals often have no rational incentive to consider the impacts of their decisions and actions on others. Clearly some people do. They may subscribe to an ethical, moral, philosophical, or religious code of conduct that places value on consideration of the effects of their behavior on others. However, these are learned codes of behavior and involve disciplined suppression of their human nature. Economists tend to argue that human nature is rationally self-interested, and human beings usually have to be incentivized to change their behavior in a manner that may be counter to their self-interest. With all of these points in mind, let's talk about how you should prepare for your Social Responsibility Competency essay question on Unit Exam 1. Think about the seven policy scenarios I described to you earlier in this lecture. I will provide you with a separate list of these policy scenarios in the form of a PDF file. Some of the policies listed may have actually been enacted in some jurisdictions, 
uh, or may have been proposed in other jurisdictions, for our purposes, assume that all are policies that are currently enacted in some governing jurisdiction, whether local, state, or national. Whether While there is not a lot of information provided for any of the policies in the list, think about what might motivate a government to adopt and implement each of these policies. A state law that requires owners of motor vehicles to have their vehicles inspected annually for compliance with operational safety standards or by a licensed inspection professional. The law empowers police officers to cite motorists driving vehicles that do not have documentation indicating that the vehicle has passed a safety inspection. A state law that holds bartenders or anyone serving alcohol in a bar or restaurant legally liable for a customer's injuries or injuries or property damages to third parties as a result of a motor vehicle crash involving a DUI or a DWI by the person the bartender or waiter served. If it can be established that the server knowingly served the customer causing the crash too much alcohol. Childhood immunization requirement, a state law that requires parents or legal guardians to have their children immunized according to the established medical practices, unless the parent or guardian can claim a religious exemption. A ban on texting and driving, a local city ordinance that sets stricter criminal penalties for motor vehicle operators who use a cell phone for text messaging or to conduct telephone conversations while driving, with exemptions for hand-free devices or for using the cell phone for navigation or playing music. A sugar tax on junk food. A federal law that places an excise tax, a special sales tax, on non-essential high sugar content food items in an effort to curb the obesity epidemic, particularly among children. Bans on smoking in public places. Local city ordinance that prohibits smoking or vaping in all indoor businesses or government buildings that are open to the public. The law provides for financial penalties to be imposed on violators, including penalties on business owners that do not enforce the ban. Uh, a state law that requires individual having knowledge of or suspecting physical, sexual, or verbal abuse of a child to report information to law enforcement and impose imposes penalties for failing to report such abuse. On Unit Exam 1, you will be asked to write an essay in which you address the following items in reference to one of the policies previously mentioned. This writing prompt will also be provided to you in the previously mentioned PDF file. 1. What is the, po the problem that the policy is intended to remedy? You should discuss the problem using the concepts and terminology introduced in our treatment of positive and negative externalities and social responsibility. Two, identify two alternatives to the policy that might be feasible solutions to the problem. The policy you are presented with on the exam and the two alternatives that you come up with means that there are three feasible alternatives that you will be discussing in your essay. I will give you one on the exam. You will identify two others that you believe might be feasible responses to the problem you identified in question number one. Three, identify up to three arguments supporting each of the three alternatives. That is, identify at least one argument, but no more than three arguments, supporting alternative one, at least one, but no more than three arguments supporting alternative two, and the same for alternative three. Arguments in favor of an alternative, pros, should indicate how the alternative induces persons targeted by the policy to recognize and accept social responsibility for their actions. Again, you should use the concepts and terminology introduced in our treatment of positive and negative externalities and social responsibility. Four, Identify up to three arguments in opposition to each of the three alternatives. That is, identify at least one argument, but no more than three arguments, opposing alternative one. At least one, but no more than three, opposing alternative two. And the same for alternative three. Arguments in opposition to an alternative, cons, 
should indicate how the alternative fails to induce persons targeted by the policy to recognize and accept social responsibility for their actions or behaviors that could result in other undesirable consequences. Again, you should use the concepts and terminology introduced in our treatment of positive and negative externalities and social responsibility. Five, indicate which of the three alternatives you would select if you had to decide which should become the adopted policy. Explain why you think your choice is best. Of course, you should use the concepts and terminology introduced in our treatment of positive and negative externalities and social responsibilities to make your case. Again, as I said, this writing prompt will be provided to you in the previously mentioned PDF file. While taking the exam, you will be permitted to refer to one 3x5 index card on which you may have handwritten notes related to the concepts of positive and negative externalities, social responsibility, and any or all of the seven policies from the, bu from the bullet list that we provided. The index card you refer to must conform to the following criteria. One, you may only use the index card provided to you by the professor. No other index cards will be permitted. Two, the professor will demonstrate, oh, excuse me, the professor will distribute index cards to students by U.S. Postal Service about two weeks before the date of Unit Exam 1. This means that you will need to provide the professor with your preferred mailing address as soon as possible. You may send your mailing address to the professor by email at this email address, faganw at wcjc.edu. If you lose your index card before the date of the exam, you may request a replacement. However, given the limitations that have resulted from the coronavirus pandemic, it may be very difficult for me to distribute replacement cards in a timely manner. I will not under any circumstances distribute replacement cards during the testing period, that is, while the exam is accessible, while people are taking the exam. Three. Any notes you write on the index card must be written in blue ink or in blue marker in your handwriting. No other color or pencil written notes will be permitted. No computer printed or photocopied notes will be permitted. If you do not currently have a blue pen or blue marker, you must obtain one. You must write any notes you plan to refer to during the administration of the exam on the index card before you log in to the exam on Blackboard. You will not be permitted to have a pen, marker, pencil, or any other writing implement out to add notes onto the card after logging into Blackboard to take the exam. The notes you write on the index card, number five, the notes that you write on the index card must be limited to information related to the course presentation of positive and negative externalities, social responsibility, and or the seven policies from the bulleted list. Notes drawn from outside sources will not be permitted. Notes about other information that may be tested on the exam will not be permitted. Six, notes may be random or organized in outline form. However, you may neither write complete sentences, nor may you write a draft of an entire essay or partial essay on the index card. Write only key words and brief descriptions on the card. I will require you to compose your essay during the testing period and not on the index card. There are two check boxes on the non-ruled side of the card. You must check the box that applies to you. Number eight, you must sign and date the card on the date that the exam is administered. Number nine, you will not be permitted to refer to a classmate's notes during the exam. Number 10, I will verify that you have satisfied these criteria by closely examining the video and audio files produced by Respondus Monitor. In the pre-exam sequence at the start of the testing session, 
you will be instructed to hold your index card to your webcam so that I can clearly see whether you have complied with these criteria. Failure to comply with these criteria will result in your exam attempt not being accepted for scoring. A score of zero will be entered into the gradebook for your attempt. Number 11, your index card must be physically returned to me within one week of the date on the, of the exam. The card may be returned by U.S. Postal Service to this mailing address, W. Fagan, Jr., Wharton County Junior College, Richmond, Texas, 240K, 5333 FM 1640, Richmond, Texas, 77469. Failure to return your unmodified index card at that time will result in your exam not being accepted for grading and a score of zero being entered in the gradebook for your attempt on the exam. Number 12, the professor reserves the right to modify these cr criteria as deemed necessary before and up to the date of the exam. Okay, that's it for part two of the special lecture presentation on the core competencies. Next up, part three will deal with the specifics of core competency two, personal responsibility.